But this morning, we're going to be taking a look at what does God want and expect from us as we consider the Lord's Communion. We're taking the Lord's Communion this morning. We're receiving it together. We're celebrating. As Pastor Rick mentioned, we've got a water baptism coming up. And the two sacraments of our church are water baptism and Holy Communion. And we put a, a special emphasis on the importance of both of those. Yeah. And as he mentioned with water baptism, if you're maybe, maybe you've never been water baptized. Maybe you were saved years ago and, and you need to follow through on that. Uh, of all the things that God asks you to do after you're saved... The easiest probably is water baptism. I know. Some, what's hard about water baptism? Somebody get you wet. <laughs> you have to get up in front of people. Ooh, that's something. So uh, uh, that's the easiest thing that God's going to ask you to do. And it's one of the first things. And so responding to that, and actually water baptism is your testimony. That who I was isn't who I am anymore. That demonstration of going into a water grave and coming back up resurrected as a new person. Old things are passed away. All things are new again. And so if, if you haven't experienced that, or maybe you got saved, you got water baptized, and since then God has done something in your life, a renewing that you need to testify about that, and a good time to do it would be for you to get water baptized again. I don't think there's any limitations on it. Some people say we need to have communion every week. Some people say we need to have it once a year. And some people, it's somewhere in between. Water baptism is the same. There's nothing saying, here's too many water baptisms. Okay? So if you feel like that's something you need and, and would be beneficial, then you need to talk to me and we'll set that up. We're going to be doing it. And as Tish said, what is she pretty? I was up there thinking, man, that's a pretty good one. So, uh, where was I? Oh, I forgot. Um, as Tish said, it, one way to, to celebrate a water baptism and to let your pastor know you love him is bring a guest. Bring someone so that they can, can see and, and experience that the water baptism is a visual, it is an audible, and the people that are getting water baptized, it's a t touch sensation. All those things. All those going on, it's incredible. And to take part in that, and in the same way, the elements. There's, there's taste involved. There's the visual involved. There's the hearing. All these things. So God uses all this to celebrate what he's done in us and is doing through us. So I want you to be involved in that. And this morning, as we're considering Holy Communion, I want to ask you, what does God want and expect from us as we... Get ready to take Holy Communion. And what does God want from, from the world around us? The scripture says it's His will that none should perish, but that all should have eternal life. So one of the things I believe God wants from us and expects from us is for us to be a living testimony of the saving power of Jesus Christ. He wants us to be praying for how many of you? How many of you here, maybe there's a few of us, that know people, that love people, that need to be saved and they're not. Is there anybody with me? There's a few of us that want to see people saved. So these cards that you've got, we're going to pray over these, and then you're going to fill out what God lays on your heart. Or who God lays on your heart. All of you should have pens in your, in your pews or in your pockets. Uh, check your neighbor's pockets, see if they got a pen for you. Okay? But it says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It goes on and says, I am committed to pray and look for opportunities daily to win these people to Christ. And a year and a half ago in our Wednesday night Bible study, we filled out some blue cards. And uh, it's names of people that we wanted to see saved. And those blue cards, every week, unless there was a holiday or something going on that we rescheduled, but every week over the past year and a half, those people have been prayed for that God would save their souls. And I'm afraid sometimes we fill out cards like that, turn them in, then we forget that we've even filled them out or who's on the card. And so what I want you to do also, how, how many of you have a bulletin this morning? A few of you? Look on the back. There's blank spot there. I'll be honest with you. It says, it, what does it say, sermon notes? I have never seen anything written on the back of that after service. Oh, good. Leah, thank you. You get a pass. 
And you, okay, you get, a few people get a pass, okay? But on that, maybe on the bottom corner, I want you to make your copy of who you're going to write down on this yellow sheet of paper. And you take that home with you and you put it up on your refrigerator. That's, I found if I want to see something again, I put it on the refrigerator. I go there religiously. <laughs> and so put it on the refrigerator. Every time you go to the refrigerator and you see that, then don't put it around on the side towards the wall. Put it out about eye level where you typically stand when you open the door so you will see this. And even if it's just a quick prayer, every time you go to the to the to the refrigerator. How many of you know the fervent effectual prayer of the righteous avails much? And as we continue to pray, to, to seek God for these people, as we continue crying out to God, and if we're going, if, if we're cry, crying out to God every time we open the refrigerator for these people, how many of you know when we go to our knees in prayer, we're going to be thinking about those people? Amen. And God's going to lay them on our hearts. So as we pray, then I want you to write down your list on the yellow, and then I want you to copy that list onto your bulletin or if you, if you want to put it in your cell phone, your smartphone, whatever. But uh, we're going to do that. But I believe God wants to do some incredible things and it starts with salvation. It starts, if, if you don't have salvation in the mix, then you ain't in the mix. God wants to save people. He loves people more than anything. And this morning we're going to pray and ask God who we should put down on our list. So Father, in Jesus' name this morning. All of us have thoughts, but we want to hear from you because, Lord, you know who you're working on, who you're dealing with, and who needs that little extra push to find Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that you love us so much that you willingly gave your one and only Son that he would die on the cross and his blood would be the atonement at one moment. <laughs> the forgiveness of our sins so that we can be at one with you. Thank you that he rose again. Thank you that he's preparing a place for us right now. Thank you that he's at your right hand interceding for me right now. Thank you, Father, that you love me so much. And thank you, Lord, that you love people so much. Help me to love people the way that you love me. Now, Father, let us know who it is that you desire us to be lifting up in prayer. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I need to get paid. Preach it. Yeah, Dave saw me coming. He let me check his pocket, so he got me a pen. Yes, ma'am. Well, they're often, and I want to say, if I can pronounce the word, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've had two so far. Yeah. Three. Yeah. Three? Mephib Mephibosheth? Okay, good. Those of you that don't know what we're talking about, y'all got an email. If, if, if you didn't get an email, if you don't have email, you need to get email. And if you got email, we need to have your email. Okay. I can. Because you might be missing out on some cool stuff. If you want to go over and jump off the bridge, you're welcome to do that afterward. Yeah, we won't get in the way. All right, so as we're uh, as you filled these out, we're going to hang on to them because we've got something special to use them for at the end of service. So put those off to the side. And if you would, open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What does God want and expect? 
And today we're going to consider that question with communion in mind. We want to consider God's purpose, God's the cost that God's paid and the value of what He's given us through this communion and what it celebrates. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. How many of you know he's coming? Amen. Now, how many of you like me since you were young have heard he's coming soon? Yes. Has anybody seen it happen yet? No. Does that mean it's not going to happen? Does that mean it's coming, his coming is sooner than it was then? Yes. His coming is sooner than it was then. His coming is sooner than it was then. As it says, for as often as you eat this bread, today as we eat the bread, I want us to be thinking about that and drink the cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he is coming. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. How many of you have heard that? You've probably heard me say it. We don't want to receive the elements in an unworthy fashion because it's detrimental to us. So we always, when we have communion, we say, take a look at yourself. Take stock in your life and who you are. The Bible says examine, a man must examine himself and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. That's if he doesn't judge himself right. He's bringing judgment to himself. For this reason many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. How many of you have ever looked at somebody and said, don't judge me? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Don't judge me. Who, who made you my judge? Mm -hmm. You know, who made you the boss? As kids, we are always saying that. It says, but if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Father, we come before you today in Jesus' name knowing that if, if we are judged without Jesus Christ, we are at loss. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that our hearts would be laid open and bare before you this morning. Lord, that we would examine ourselves as your word tells us and allow you to speak your truth, your desire into our life. Father, this morning I pray in Jesus' name that we will recognize not only that that we will stand in judgment if we're not ready. But all the people around us, the people of this world, if they're not ready to stand in the presence of God, they will find judgment that they don't want to hear. Now, Lord, touch us today and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'm, as I consider this message this morning about the fact that, that God wants people to be saved. He loves the world so much, He wants them to be saved. 
And since the last time we spoke on a Sunday morning, I, I believe it was late Sunday night last week that the greatest mass shooting in American history took place. Yeah. And we could rehash that, I'll be honest with you, I'm getting tired of people wanting to know what was on that man's mind. Yeah. I'm getting tired of people trying to figure out his motivation. I'm going to tell you straight up, and I think our president probably said it best, it was evil. <coughs> Satanic. God loves people, and he wants people to experience life, and that life more abundantly. Yeah. But Satan, <coughs> excuse me, Satan, hates people. He hates you. He hates the people around you. He hates the people that were in that crowd that was being shot at. He hates the man who shot at them. I believe he inspired them because he wanted to see as many souls as possible curled into eternity. And that's what took place. Were they saved? Were they not saved? I'm not going to judge that. That's up to God. But this morning, we need to understand that Satan's job is to steal, to kill, and destroy. Amen. And when we're living in a nation where no one can understand why, and the Word of God tells us, in the end times, the hearts of men will wax cold. They'll be lovers of self. Lovers of... Uh, what, what, what was it he loved? I don't know, fame? Wanted people talking about him? I don't know what it was. But Satan wants to destroy. And this morning, God is speaking to us and he says, I came, my son came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And as we take a look at the word today, I want us to, to, to take hold of the fact that God wants all the people, that, he wants the people that you come into contact with every day to have life. He wants, he wants your mailman Male person, I'm sorry. <laughs> he wants your garbage person. He wants, he wants the water meter person. He wants the person that rings up your, your, the, the, your food items at, at the grocery store. He wants, he wants the people that bring you food at a restaurant. He wants, he wants the people that send you tax audit stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Wants, let me tell you something. He wants your worst enemy saved. Amen. That's Do you? True. That's the question. Do we want to see people saved? What was the purpose, the cost, and the value of the crucifixion? What is the purpose, the cost, and the value of this communion that we receive every, every time we gather together for communion? When we consider communion and the fact that it represents the, community, the, the crucifixion, how should we approach the scripture but a man must examine himself? I want you to think about that this morning. So often we read a portion of this scripture, but we leave out that a man must examine himself. I'll be honest with you, when I've quoted the scripture when we're having communion, I haven't gone all the way through and quoted that fact. I've referred to it. But the fact is, how do, we, how do we bring that into the picture that a man must examine himself? And I think as we, as we look at that, God wants us to consider the purpose, the cost, and the value, not only of communion, but the purpose, the cost, and the value of examining ourselves. Are you able and willing to examine yourself. I know, we're all in a hurry to examine other people. Did you see, did you see what he did? Can you believe what they're doing? We're, we're quick, man. We can find what's wrong with everybody and everything. And then we walk in the church. It, it just drives me nuts to the pastor. When I'm ready for church and I walk out the, in the foyer to say, hey, how you doing? I hear people say, I'm just so upset. <laughs> Do you can you believe what and the fact is that, that we need to examine not others, 
As I said last week, the world already knows that it's sinning. It doesn't need us continually pointing out everything that's wrong with them. It needs us to point to Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we consider that, first, let's take a look at that, that purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. What is the purpose for my examining myself? Well, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Test yourself. How do you test yourself? You ever, you ever had to get ready for a big test that's coming up? So what do you do? Analytic. You study, okay? And then to make sure, how do you examine yourself to make sure you've studied enough? What do you do? You test yourself. You get a, 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 what do they call it? Friend. <laughs> To help you study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but, but a, a, a test that's not the real test, but an example. A cheat sheet. A what? A practice test. A practice test. That's what I'm looking for, a practice test. Not a, no, we're not cheating, Dan. Don't help me. You get yourself a practice test, and you start going through the questions, and then you answer them, and then you look to see what the answer should be and what you answer. As we get God's word out, we begin asking ourselves questions. And we give those answers. Then we start seeing how our answers align up with the word of God. So says, test yourself and to see if you are in the faith. How do you do that? Well, let's take a look at Jesus. We're called Christians for a reason. They were first called Christians, I believe, in Antioch. And I think that was probably a slur, but they took it as a badge of honor. Yeah, I'm like Christ. You people, all oh, you Christians, you're like that Jesus guy that ran. We killed him. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, that's us. We're like Christ. So take a look at the life of Christ and take a look at my life. And how does it line up? What did Jesus do for a living? What am I doing for a living? How hard did he work? How hard do I work? What did he do for his friends? What do I do for my friends? What did he do for entertainment? What do I do for entertainment? Oh. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, God's been dealing with me as, uh, since I've, I've, I've started ministering as a presbyter. He started laying some, some load on me. Said, you know, I know his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light, but he put a little bit more weight on me. Asking me, do I really want to be responsible for those other pastors and what they might do? <laughs> That's a little scary. I'm sitting down with some of them saying, how are you doing? And you know, if those of you that don't know, uh, we pastors, we don't lie. We just, we don't, we just, I don't know. We just tell it a different way. So look at, how are you doing in your thoughts? How's your mind going? I had one young fellow, it was hard getting a time set up with him. I got it set up and only got a half an hour in the time slot. And I thought, well, I can't do all this in a half an hour. So I went and sat down with him. And I said, look, normally I'm sitting down to eat with somebody and taking an hour or so just to talk to them, find out how they're doing. We don't have that much time. And I looked at him and said, so when's the last time you saw a woman that was naked to one your wife? Oh, yeah. yeah, he looked like you. What? <laughs> I started finding out some things and I thought, man, Lord, I don't know if I want to know. But start asking yourself those tough questions. Start asking yourself, what am I doing for entertainment? Where does my mind go when it's not on Christ? How am I, how am I doing? How am I really doing? In the depths of my being. Not what I'm showing everyone else. And I'd encourage you, you need to have somebody that will ask you some of those tough questions. People that, uh, and it, we live in a day and age where we have throwaway friendships, throwaway relationships. You know, I, I gave into that for a while as a pastor. Oh God, if I tell them that, they'll get mad and leave the church. I don't want people, I don't want people leaving the church. Finally, God's got me to the point of saying, well, God, they're in your hands. I'm going to say what you tell me to say. But have people that will tell you straight up, 
This is what you need to hear. To ask you questions. What's going on? That's how you help to examine yourself. Not only do you take the test, but how often do you get together with someone else who's going through the same course, and they're taking, they're asking you the questions, and you're giving them the answers, and they're telling you whether you're right or wrong. And I believe as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to embrace that, take hold of that, and I think we all need to look at our lives and say, who do I have in my life who will ask me the tough questions? And I will answer them honestly. Myself, I've got, I've got about four guys that I've gone to and said, look, I want you, I want you to keep praying for me. But, uh, and, and in that, if God speaks something to your heart, or you see something in me that, that bothers your spirit, I want you to know that you have free access to ask me any question you want, and I will answer you honestly. And you know what that does? First, when I get ready to do something stupid, and all of a sudden the Lord says, well, if, if my conviction isn't going to get you, what about when they ask you? How are you going to deal with it? Oh, okay, yeah, you're right. You know, to, to step back. But it, it also builds that relationship because how many of you know they need someone who's going to look at them and say, hey, hey, what's going on in your life? And we could start having those relationships that glorify God and begin building one another up and we see a strength come into our life instead of a casual serving of God, we start getting serious about serving God when we have these relationships. Test yourselves and see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to test? Galatians 6, 4. But each one must examine his own work. And then he will have reason for boasting. How many of you have seen yourself standing in front of God saying, look what I did? <laughs> Wait a minute. I was hoping you'd say that. How many of you have children that you loved it when they came home from school and said, I got an A, look! And you looked at them and said, who do you think you are? <laughs> Drag it to me. No, you said, well, let's celebrate. I'm going to take you out for ice cream. And it was your benefit too. <laughs> God, I believe this scripture is telling us that God wants us to live in such a way that we can come before him not saying, oh, check me out, God, you know, boasting. But coming in and saying, God, did you see what happened today? I got to talk to that waitress and she said she's going to get into your word and I'm asking you now if you'll save her. Wasn't that great, God, that she let me talk to her? Yes. There's some boasting. I think God wants us to come to him and say, God, it was a tough day. Yes. I had some trials. I almost gave in. But I held your hand, and I won. Amen. We can boast. It says, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone. And not in regards to another. Boy, that rings true. God doesn't want us to come saying, look what Water's Edge did, and I was a part of that church. Because <laughs> I think God's going to say, and what was your part in that? I'll be honest with you, we, we've had some people ask about closing the food pantry. One of the reasons was God was dealing with my heart, that we as a church were saying, hey, we're a food pantry. We feed people all over our area. Aren't we something? And my thought is, and that person saying that, what have you done? Have you served? Have you worked? Have you brought food? Have you given? What have you... It wasn't happening. We were boasting in the work of others. And that's what it says here. In, uh, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regards to another. God wants his children to be able to say, Daddy, Daddy, look what I've done. Look what I got to do. Isn't that incredible? And God is there saying, I saw. That was great. You know, Stephen, I met he, his first goal. I went to all the games except that one. And when he got home and he said, 
I scored my first goal. I, I was able to say, I know, I was cheering. One of the fathers sent me a text and told me about it. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, that's what God wants to have with us. That relationship. And when we test ourselves, that's the kind of relationship we can have. And as I was studying this, the question keeps coming up, are you, how are you at examining yourself. As I was putting this message together, I was reminded of, of uh, Wednesday night with John Bevere. And by the way, if you haven't been coming on Wednesday night, uh, and I know some people like some things, some people like other things. I'm just getting cranked up about this video that we're watching of John Bevere. And uh, he asked God a question. Why am I not operating in a greater anointing? You ever wondered that? Lord, why am I not operating in a great... I, I pray, I spend some time fasting, I read your word, I, I, I come to church, I'm trying to do all the things, I pay my tithe. Uh, why am I not answered, uh, uh, operating in greater anointing? And God's answer to him was, you tolerate sin. And as I begin looking at that, examining myself, Wednesday night after Bible study, I had to think, do I tolerate sin? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 is what the Lord spoke to John Bevere. He said, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Here's why Jesus received that blessing. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you. Let me say that again. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Hated. How many times have you seen sin on TV and that's been your entertainment? No, don't answer. I'm, I'm guilty too. Jesus loved righteousness and he hated lawlessness. Therefore God, his God, has anointed him with the oil of gladness above all his companions. You want to operate in a greater anointing? You want to operate more full of the power of God? You want to operate with a greater understanding? You want to have a greater love in your life? Start loving righteousness and hating sin the way Jesus did. That's part of the test. Because Jesus loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, his God, anointed him. As an oil of gladness. How many of you could use a little more gladness in your life? Yes. Above anyone and everyone. Jesus has, he, he has the title of prophet, priest, and king. You look in the word of God, there is no one that holds all three of those titles at the same time. He is prophet, priest, and king. Why? Because he loved righteousness and he hated lawlessness. The purpose of examining yourself is to find out do you really love righteousness and do you really hate evil. And how far do you go with that? Are you able and willing to examine yourself? That's the question this morning. Next, we're looking at the cost. When we're actually willing to say in Psalms chapter 139 verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. To be able to say, search me, O oh God. Look deep inside of me. Look beyond what I show everyone else. And see if there's anything hurtful. Oh, in the church, we need to hear this. Probably be easiest to have a show of hands with anyone who hasn't been hurt in the church at one point or another. I think we all probably have. Some more than others. That hurtfulness that comes out. And he's saying, 
See if there's any hurtful way in me. If there's anything in me that wants to hurt someone else, that's wrong. And lead me in the everlasting way. There's a cost in opening up and saying, Lord, search me. Psalm 26, verse 2 says, Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. We've talked about it before. The, the, the mind puts out neurons, the brain puts out neurons, the, the, the heart, they, they found put out neurons, and so does the gut, the stomach. And we've got to, not only what we're thinking, but what we're feeling, what we're sensing. Search me, God. Examine me, test my mind and my heart. Does it line up? Job chapter 31 verse 6. Here's where we're getting into the cost of, of examining yourself. Verse 6 says, Let him weigh me with accurate scales and let God know my integrity. How many of you know what integrity is? <laughs> I used to say integrity is what you do when nobody's looking or lack thereof. How much integrity you have is determined by what you do when nobody's looking. We've had some, some politicians over my lifetime that have caused me to say, integrity is how you explain what you did when no one was looking. <laughs> integrity. And he's saying, let, let him examine, or let me weigh, him weigh me in, at, with accurate scales and let him know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart followed my eyes. Oh, where's our, where are our eyes going? Or do we have a covenant with, my, with our eyes that we won't look at things that we shouldn't be looking at? Amen. Because where, when our, heart, our eyes go, it's not long before our heart will follow our eyes. Or if any spot has stuck to my hand, if I've gotten my hands dirty. If that's the case, he goes on in verse 8, and he says, let me sow and another eat, and let my crops be uprooted. He said, I would rather please God with the life I'm living, but if I'm not going to, then my prayer is that whatever I touch falls apart, and everything I plant dies and, and doesn't produce. He says, examine me, God, and let me be willing. We have to be willing to say, Lord, I'll change. I'll leave those things behind that aren't pleasing to you. It's one thing to say, Pastor, I have a drug problem or alcohol problem. Maybe I've got a porn problem or a theft problem, anger, lust, greed. It's one thing to, to come to the pastor and, and confess those things. And the Bible says we are to confess our sins one to another. But I believe we're supposed to take it to the next step and stop. Yes. We're to stop. To let go. To say, God, the cost is going to be me not doing that anymore. And some of those that we can get addicted, okay, we, we, can, we can use that word. And God can say, hey, I don't like that anymore. I remember not too long after we merged the churches together. God started dealing with me about, you know, I was, I was figuring out, I, I, was, I didn't grow up Catholic, so I didn't know what Lent was all about. I remember walking into a store and seeing someone with, with a mark across their forehead, and I thought, should I tell them? <laughs> do, do, they, do they know that they got something? Hey. Yeah. And somebody grabbed me and said, oh, no, no. That, they, that's, they do that. Ash Wednesday, and then they give some, isn't it? Ash Wednesday? Yeah. yeah, and they give it up for Lent. And so, I, oh, okay, so, so I'm thinking about that. It came around Ash Wednesday, and I thought, and the Lord started dealing with me. Are you willing to give up something for me? I said, well, yeah, Lord. What do you want me to do? And he said, fast chocolate. <laughs> oh, man. I, let me, I'm rusty, and I'm a chocoholic, and I'm not trying to recover. Okay? 
And God said, give that. And you know what? I had headaches for the first few days. Mm. I got a little bit cranky. <laughs> I got a little bit ornery. And you know what happens when you fast chocolate? People don't know you're fasting chocolate and they bring you chocolate. Get out of gifty behind you. <laughs> Be a coffee. And, and that's it. Maybe, you know, maybe God would search your heart and say, you know, that coffee is more, you, you head straight to that coffee instead of talking to me in the morning. Oh, but Lord, i got to have my cup of coffee. You won't like what I say. You know? <laughs> I don't drink coffee, so I'm guessing from what I've seen. But what, what is it that's in your life that if you say, search me, O oh God, that it might cost you? But what's it really cost? You know what? I found out after a few weeks, I don't have to have chocolate. And I found out by Easter Sunday, and the kids are running around eating the, I got a little bit of their chocolate tape. It was better than it had ever been before. <laughs> it was wonderful. I thought, I should have done, no, I don't want to do this anymore, God. No, <laughs> but we need to be willing to give these things up. We need to be willing not just to say, this is who, what, what my problem is, but we need to be willing to stop. What would you have to leave behind today if you really examined yourself? Are you able and willing examine yourself. And finally, value. What is the value of examining yourself? Luke 18, 28. Peter had been examining himself, looking at his life, considering where he had been and where he had come to and what the future held. Peter said, Behold, we have left our own homes, uh, our own homes to follow you. He's speaking to Jesus and he said to them, Truly I say unto you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brother or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Whatever it is that you're willing to let go of so that you can love righteousness and hate sin, Jesus is saying, what, anyone that has left any of that, verse 30, who will not receive many times as much at this time, right now, today, how many of you know when you're righteous and you live for Jesus Christ and you serve Him with all your heart, you're going to get blessings on this earth. Amen. That's what the scripture says. It says, who will not receive many times as much at this time. If I, I've, I've enjoyed the fact. There have been times in ministry where I thought, Lord, my children... Am I, am I doing them a disservice with, with what ministry is costing us? And God brings me back to this and says, anything that your children have missed out on so that you could do ministry the way I've called you to do it, they're going to get many times over. And how many of you know I can say, God has blessed my kids. He's blessed us. I left when, when, I, when I got into ministry. I had been, Tish and I had just got married. We were, we were living the dream. She was working in a bank. I don't know that she, that she would call that a dream. I was working for my dad in the machine shop running a steel lathe. I had talked about it all my life. I want to be a machinist when I grow up. And I loved running that steel lathe. But I found as I ran the steel lathe, my mind kept going to ministry. And God kept drawing me. And I said, God, how can I... All my family's here. You know, at that time, my... My, my grandparents, my parents, my aunt and uncle, my sister, my wife and I, we're all there going to the same church, seeing each other all the time. Knowing that when my kids started growing up, they'd have the same blessing I had. I had both sets of grandparents right there in town and an extra set of great-grandmother great, and great-grandfather in town. I saw them all the time. They invested in me. They loved on me. Now the Lord, I had to Take my children. And God said, I will repay that many times over. And this scripture reveals that. Who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. 
eternal life. What is the purpose, the cost, and the value of your walking with Christ? What is the purpose of your walking with Christ? What is the cost of you walking with Christ? And what is the value of you walking with Christ? Is that walk with Christ <coughs> authentic? Let me ask you this morning, what is God expecting from you as we consider communion and examining ourselves? This morning, I want to read a few scriptures. Then Pastor Rick is going to come We'll give instructions on communion. The Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins, who is wise, wins souls. Let me say that again. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. What is the purpose, the cost, and the value of walking with Christ? James chapter 5, verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You have that kind of power. 1 Corinthians Chapter 9, verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. Some of you might say, oh, that's not my personality, Pastor. I just don't have that in me. Let me tell you something. It's not about you. It's about Him. And if the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ up from the dead, <coughs> then your body will be quickened and you'll be able to do. He said to the Jews, I became as a Jew, so that I may win some Jews. To those who are under the law, I, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel. That's a powerful statement. I do all things. Everything I do is what Paul is saying. Everything I do is for the sake of the gospel. So that I may become a fellow partaker of it. This morning, as you're examining yourself, before we receive communion, how are you coming out? Are you able to run to God and say, Look what I've done with the life you've given me? Master, Master, you gave me five talents. I turned them into ten. And the Master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Where we find ourselves saying, Master, I knew you were a hard, hard taskmaster. And I was afraid of losing it. I was afraid of doing something wrong with what you've given me. So I buried it, kept it, cured it. Said, depart from me, you wicked, useless servant. 
Paul said, I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. You know, as I was praying for this message this morning, the Lord spoke to my heart. And he started reminding me, as we're going before him to celebrate communion, he started reminding me of what communion costs. Here at the church, we buy the, the crackers and break them into pieces and put them in. That's not that expensive. We get the grape juice and put it in the cups. That's not that expensive. We've got some nice containers that hold them, but we've been using them for years. We've gotten our money's worth out of them. Really, we, it hasn't been that expensive for us. But how expensive was it for the Father? his one and only son. He treated the way Jesus was treated. God started speaking to me about that fact this morning. He started reminding me of the, the beating, the humiliation. He reminded me of the scourging and the stripes. He reminded me that in the midst of it, and I don't know how he did this, he didn't even say a railing word against them. I think I got a halfway decent hold on my mouth, but I think at one point in there, I would have been telling them what for. I would have probably been pulling out the card, do you know who I am? Do you know I could call down a legion of angels and they would smash you right now? But Jesus was tougher than me. And he took it. He carried his own cross. He was nailed to that cross. He was raised up naked, hanging from the cross dropped into the hall. Crown of thorns on his head that they had been beating on. Parts of his beard that had been torn out. He was unrecognizable. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, my son didn't die a casual death. I said, no, Lord, he didn't. And he asked me, then why are you trying to live a casual death? Maybe this was just meant for me. Maybe I'm just taking it out on you, but I think God wanted me to share that. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't die a casual death for us. Why are we trying to live a casual life for him? This morning, we're going to come and bring our cards. Excuse me. And I would like everyone this morning as we come to bring those cards with you. Matter of fact, I'd like for you to look at them right now. As you're looking at that card, I believe the Holy Spirit would say, I love these people. I really love them. And I want to see them in my family. But I believe the Lord is saying, until you until I take it seriously. 
Jesus, he died so that we could live. So that they could live. This morning, as we celebrate the emblems, the body and the blood of Christ for us, Pastor Rick and I will distribute the emblems as you receive then I'd like for you to go over and place your yellow card on one of the altars. And then we'll continue by receiving the emblems together. And you'll take your other card, your, whatever you wrote the names on, you'll take them home. Put them somewhere where you'll see them. You'll be praying constantly. And I want you to pray that, that God will touch them so that they are ready That they're ready. It's not an emotional response to a service or a, a call. But it's something that they're ready for the service or the call. And they're going to give their hearts to the Lord. And it's going to be for eternity. And we're going to be collecting these. And every, every Monday when we come together for prayer as we've been doing, we'll take these and we will pass them out to everyone. We're going to lay our hands on them. We're going to call out to the Lord for their salvation. God wants to see people saved. We need to want to see people saved. As we celebrate communion, the cost, let's add as much value to that cost by bringing people to Jesus Christ as we can. Pastor Rick, would you come? Would you get the envelopes ready? I'd like to ask you all to stand with me. And if you're not if you're not ready to, to receive today, typically I say you need to refrain, but the scripture just says, get your heart right. It only takes a moment to say, search me. To repent. And to live an active life for you. Father, this morning, as we have gathered together in the name of Jesus, you have issued a challenge to us to search our hearts, to examine our hearts. And does that challenge come up with a solution that says we're accomplishing your will? If it is, then we should see souls. Father, if we're not fulfilling your plan, then we need to break our hearts, O oh God. This week as our nation has been heartbroken over all these that have been viciously killed, slaughtered. Lord, how many people in a week have died in our nation not knowing Jesus Christ, destined for an eternity separate from him. Destined for him. Now, God, I ask that you would forgive us of our selfishness. Search us, O oh God. Cleanse us from any unrighteousness. And then help us to change. That we will love righteousness and hate sin. Thank you for the price that was paid so that we could be washed. Would you come? Receive of the emblems. Place your card on the altar. And continue in attitude.
speaking the Holy Spirit. Believe that God wants to change our hearts. I'm, I'm believing that the trumpet can sound before I finish this sentence. And God so wants more people to be saved. And this morning, as we come together, celebrate the body and the blood of Christ so that we can be saved. Let's make sure that we're examining ourselves. Let's make sure that we are sharing that information with everyone and anyone. As I read openings of scripture today, Jesus took the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. Broken for you. Did you get any in the corner? He said, this is my body broken for you. And we can look at the disciples and say, they really didn't know what he was saying to me, did they? Sometimes I look at us and say, do we really know what he was saying? The cost of the body of Christ. <clears throat> this morning, let's celebrate the body of Christ with a desire like never before to serve. Pastor, would you leave us in prayer? Lord Jesus, as we stand uh, <coughs> here today, we're just reminded of the incredible act of love that uh, you demonstrated. Lord, I just I think about the prayer, I think about your body, but Lord, you were beaten. And uh, Lord, I, I, I deserve that beating. Lord, you took the beating for me. You took the blame for me. Lord, all of us can probably think of the time where someone took the blame for us and how we just felt so our heart went out to that person to realize they stood up for me and 
Jesus, you did it for all of us, that you paid the price for us. Lord, as we partake of this bread, we just remember your incredible love for us. And Lord, now we set ourselves to receive that love and demonstrate that love to us. So Lord, thank you that we partake of this. We receive, God, your healing and restoration for us, body, soul, and spirit. Yes. The glory of God. We receive it in Jesus' name. Go ahead and partake. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the body of Christ. He said, as he gave him the cup, this cup is my blood. Pour it out for you. As often as you receive this, remember what it is. Lord, I'm trying, but I'm not sure I really grasp all that it cost. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Blood that was poured out free for me, for my family, Lord, for my church family, for my community of this world. Thank you for the blood of Christ that takes away all of the sin and leaves us clean and pure. Thank you for the blood that allows us to come into your presence and say, Abba, Father, Daddy, look what I've done to Thank you for the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name. Let's receive it. Thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for the body and blood of Christ, Father. Help us not to be flippant about communion, but to recognize. Lord, to be willing to examine ourselves before you. Now, Father, it's in the name of Jesus that I ask that you would pour out a blessing upon us. A blessing of being able to stand before you and as your word says, to be able to stay clean before my Lord, I stand. Lord, for us to be able to say, I stand before you clean, and there's not a blemish, not a spot, no stain, no sin that is visible. Because the blood of Christ is covered in. I pray that blessing, and I pray the blessing of passing that blessing along to the lost and the dying. Lord, we will pass that blessing along to the religious. That we will pass that blessing along to each person we come into contact with. And Lord, we will be about your business of winning the lost. Thank you that Jesus was willing not to die a casual death, which most of us hope for if we aren't taken in the rapture. But he died a violent death for us. Lord, I pray the blessing upon each one of us that we live a violent life for Jesus Christ. Your word says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. 
help us to look at our relationship with you and the life that we live in a totally different manner from this point. That blessing is what I'm believing for in each heart and life today. Lord, we give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name.